In a world where many are struggling to find truth in the Word of God, the Church of Pentecost, through its sponsored program, The Pentecost Hour, brings you godly and soul-inspiring messages from seasoned men and women of God. Your life and my life should center on Christ. We should live a life to the extent that there should be no difference between our private and public life. The more God gives us, doesn't mean we should buy more material things, but rather we should be conduit of blessings unto others. For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? God said marriage is good. God cherishes family life. And it's up to you and me to build God out. This year, our theme remain in Christ and his basic message is based on 1 John chapter 2 verse 24 to 25. As our men and women of God rightly divide the word of truth for your understanding. Pentecost are on Pent TV. Remain in Christ and his basic message. We give you glory Lord as we honor you We give you glory, Lord, as we are you. You are, you are wonderful, you are wonderful, worthy, worthy of praise, you are wonderful. For his holiness. Revelation says day and night. They never stop saying. Holy. Holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was. And is. And is to come. Hallelujah. Wonderful Savior, beautiful Savior, glorious Savior, you are wonderful, my King, you are worthy, oh, oh, oh you are one, you are wonderful, we love you, Jesus, you are glorious, oh. his love and his faithfulness we are going to praise him for his love and his faithfulness the psalmist says i will praise you lord among the nations i will sing of you among the peoples for great is your love reaching to the heavens hallelujah your faithfulness reaches to the skies be exalted oh god above the heavens let your glory be all over the earth. Hallelujah. Greatest thy faithfulness, oh God, my Father. changes any minutes promises and fails his word says his words are yea and amen forever you will be 
be. Hallelujah. Great is your faith, your faithfulness. Oh God, my Father. change you watch over your word to perform it Jesus, praise your Savior. 
flow of grace. From you flows all grace. You are the God of all grace. Great grace, much grace, exceeding grace, amazing grace, abundant grace. Grace that does not discriminate. Grace that does not differentiate. You don't look at the background. You don't look at race. You don't look at color. You don't look at education. Hallelujah. You don't look at language. You just love us. Yes. God of grace. Who sits on a throne of grace. From what flows all grace. We bless your name. People you have saved by your grace. We bless your name. We praise your name. We glorify your name. God of grace. You did not wait for us to do the right thing. But while we are still sinners, you commanded your love towards us. While we incurred your displeasure, you sought the highest form of love, the ultimate love, and you gave your life as a ransom. You took upon yourself frail humanity and, and the flesh. It is difficult for us with our human mind to understand that at some point, God, the creator of heaven and earth, was on earth as a human being. We just cannot fathom it. But that is the truth the Bible tells us without any contestation. Grace at work. Grace at work. Grace that will pardon. Grace that will enable. Grace that will open doors. Grace that will lift us up from the point of sin to the point of no sin because your grace enables. We bless your name. We you have saved from all backgrounds. Drunkards, descendants of idol worship, people who were cursed, people who did not have any glory or honor in our homes. Yet you have called us and you are not ashamed to place your holy name upon us. Grace at work. We bless your name this morning. We glorify your name. Grace, grace. We bless your name, Lord. We are doing all the false things. On a hill far away. On a hill far away. He stood on all. Is the last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross, and it changes someday for now. Oh, the old, oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to the Calvary. There is a crown. Drop is the last I lay down. I will cling, I will cling. To the old rugged cross, and exchange did someday for a crown. In the old, in the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was the old that old cross. Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Cherish the 
you rock a cross till my trough is the last I lay down. I will cling, I will cling to the old rock a cross and a chain to top day for a crown. To the old rugged cross, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Can you call me someday to my home far away when his glory forever I'll share? Cherish the old rock at Karaz till my trough is up. Is the last I lay down. I will cling to the old rock and cross. Oh, and a chance to stop dead for a So I'll tear it, tear it, till my trophies, trophies. As I will cling, I will cling to the old rock and cross. And accept that someday for a crown. I will cling to the old rock and cross. And exchange it someday for the crown. Praise the Lord. Remain in Christ and His basic message. Now, the basic message is not the elementary message. It's not as Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 put it. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from us that leads to death and of faith in God, instructions about cleansing rites, and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying that, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. And then we, as a church, we are saying that remain in the basic teachings of Christ. But this scripture that I read, this very particular version, tries to make it a bit clearer. He says that, and be taken forward to maturity, so this particular Hebrews 6 verse 1 and 2 is not against what we are talking about as a church to remain in the basic message of Christ. This one is saying that we have to move on to maturity. It says we, are, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't continue to just be new converts. We have to mature. Now let's go to chapter 5. Maybe the earlier chapter and come down maybe from verse 11 from verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 5. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Now you see, we have put chapters and verses. Otherwise, the writer was just telling a story. So he was talking about moving on to maturity. He was expressing his disappointment in the people because they were still babes. At the time that he was expecting them to be chewing bones and meat, he says that you will need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now, so he is still talking. 
Then he moves on, and then we say chapter 12. So when you say chapter 12, sometimes we confuse ourselves. But he's still talking about moving on. Then chapter 12, he says that, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Maturity. But we are saying as a church that remain in Christ and his basic message. Elementary could also be basic, but not as used in the sense in Hebrews 5 or Hebrews chapter 6. We are talking about the fundamental. We are talking about the inalienable teachings of Christ. The, those teachings that our faith is actually based on. Now, when we say something is inalienable, what we are trying to say is that you, the possessor, you shouldn't give it away nor allow someone to take it from you. If you do that, you are effectively destroying the foundation. Now, my wife is inalienable. I shouldn't give her away or I shouldn't allow anyone to take her away from me. That is why God marrying the church is a jealous God. Now, there are some of the teachings that we have to jealously guard against so that charlatans do not take them away from us. In a polarized world, in a pluralistic world like ours, where many other teachings and religions are competing for the soul of the nation and for your own soul, we are trying, they are trying to tell us that all roads lead to God. It doesn't matter where you belong. And sometimes when you have gone to school and studied logic, it becomes so reasonable. But in this age and in this time, then, now, and even for the future, Christianity remains an exclusive religion. Even though our Jesus is for all. We have to be careful what we are hearing. So that is why we are saying that remain in the basic message. Certain things are going on. People even think that there's no need to tithe. Like on Sunday morning like this, there's no need to bring tithe. Now, they are saying it from scripture, from their own interpretation. But as a church, we believe in tithing. So what do we do? We have to quickly come and tell you, my friend, remain in the basic message. Don't be deceived by these ones. In the Old Testament, the tithe was paid to a man who died, to the priest. But in the New Testament, according to Hebrews, we pay the tithe to the one who does not die. And then he mentioned his name, Jesus Christ. After the order of Melchizedek, the one that Abraham tithe, paid the tithe to. Now, Jesus, the high priest, who now collects our tithes, is never going to die. So when are we going to stop paying tithes? When? So don't tell me that it belongs to the past. It is of the Old Testament. No. The one who is designated by God to take our tithes lives forever. And he lives to collect our tithes. Even in Abraham, those days, when he was paying the tithe to Melchizedek, he said the Levites, the priests, who were later on by law asked to collect the tithes, they were paying the tithes even through Abraham. So it's not about an Old Testament stuff. It is about what God has ordained. So don't say that I'm not going to tithe because it's not necessary because I heard this pastor preach. This is the church of Pentecost. This is our belief. We tithe and we tithe to the one who does not die. Now, we may stop when he dies. We may stop. Any day that you hear that the man is dead, come and tell me we shall stop. There will be no need paying tight. This morning, I will be concentrating on the fifth tenant of the Church of Pentecost. The fifth tenant is repentance, justification, and sanctification. Time will not permit me to talk about all these three. But repentance, justification, and sanctification are not three different stages of re salvation. No. No. Repentance does not save. No. Justification does not save. Sanctification does not also save. The cause of our salvation is that man that was nailed to the tree. He is the cause of our salvation. Repentance is, our, is an effect of our belief in the finished work of Christ. Sanctification is the effect. 
Justification is also an effect. Sanctification is done by God. Justification is done by God. But repentance is my response to what I've seen Christ done for me on the cross. Then I respond by turning around and changing my mind and following it with an outward action. That is repentance. But when I give my life to Christ on that very day, by faith in the finished work of Christ, God sanctifies me. He justifies me. And I repent. Justification or the subject of justification has bearing in almost all the topics that we preach as Christians. It was the cause of the reformation in the 16th century. It is supposed to be the assumed teaching of the Protestants. All of us that came from the Catholic Church, we came because of this justification. So we assume that all of us that have come out of the Catholic tradition, we understand justification. But somehow, it is about the most confusing subject too. So I will look at justification to God and justification, its benefits to us and what it is, justification. Let's start from 1 John 5, 9 to 12. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Now, this particular verse is saying that God has given a testimony about his son. He says that we accept man's testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it's the testimony that he has given concerning his son. Sometimes when you are growing up and you have gone to school and you understand what it means to destroy or to save and you are posted to Tamale and you see this... Muslims coming out of the mosques. If you look at their numbers, sometimes you want to say that, no, God cannot possibly destroy all these people. But John is saying that God has given a testimony concerning his son. Verse 10 says that whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. Now listen, that is a very important statement. If you don't believe the testimony of God, you are effectively telling God you are a liar. But he is not. Because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. You want to open your ears and listen to the testimony that God himself has given about his son. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. And it is full stop. That is the testimony. He has declared that whoever has the son, that is Jesus, has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So it doesn't matter the numerous of people coming out of a particular building. You look at the numbers and say, can God possibly destroy all of them? It doesn't, it's not based on your sympathy. It is based on scripture. And this is the testimony of God himself. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. A testimony is a formal statement, written or spoken, given on oath. So if God has testified, it means that he has done that on oath. And he cannot go against his word. Not at all. He has declared to the whole universe and he cannot be a liar because he is not a liar. The oath is an appeal to a deity or to some revered person or thing, to witness one's determination to speak the truth or keep a promise. 
So that if you go to the court and then you want to testify, they'll give you a Bible if you are a Christian and you prefer to live the Bible or to swear by the Bible, they'll give you a Bible. Or the Quran if you are a Muslim. And then you lift it up and swear. That is to say that what I'm coming to say is the truth, nothing but the truth. Now, if you don't want to lift the Bible, you affirm what you are saying. But you are speaking on authority. And the words that ca- comes out of your mouth will take you to jail or otherwise. So, this is God's testimony. That is to say that God has made a declaration to the whole world. God has made a declaration to the whole world. That in his son is life. Hallelujah. If God testified about his son, since there's no one greater than him, how is he going to do it? Have you heard that in scripture? God says, I swear by myself. Because In the court of law, you always swear by a higher date. But God does not have anyone greater than him. So I swear by myself to Abraham. In blessing, I will bless you. Now for God to testify, it means that he has done that on oath. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, Abraham, since there was no one greater than him, that is God, to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and put an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the ends of what was promised, he confirmed with an oath. God did this so that by two unchanging things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us must be greatly encouraged. Now, God had to take an oath, even though there was none greater than him. He did this so that we can have confidence in what he has said. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now this scripture is saying that God has taken an oath. He has declared that his son is Lord and by faith in his son you will be saved. Nothing less, nothing more. Nothing less, nothing more. God has made a declaration. In John chapter 19, verse 28 to 30. Now this is later knowing that everything has now been finished. So that scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am tested. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soak a sponge in it, put a sponge on a stalk of hives of plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his ghost. He bowed his head and did what? He gave up his ghost. There's something that he has done. According to Philippians, 
Paul says that, therefore, therefore simply means that something has happened. Therefore, let's go to Philippians 2. Philippians chapter 2. From verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, why is this therefore important? For a testimony to be valid, it must be premised on something. You see, the Bible is saying that God has given a testimony concerning his son. And that testimony must be based on something. That is why Philippians, Paul is saying that, therefore, as a result, God has exalted him. It was because of what he did that God so exalted him. God didn't choose Jesus to be Lord for naught. He qualified to be Lord. He qualified to be who he is. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and has given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and on under the earth. What did he do? Hebrews chapter 10 says this. Hebrews 10 from verse 5. What did he do? Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. He's saying that when Christ was coming on the planet, Earth, being God and spirit, he says that you didn't desire sacrifices and offering, the bulls and the goats that pacified for the sin of the people. God did not desire, but God gave him the spirit, a body. So he came with a body. That is why he has to be stored in a woman's womb, and then from the womb, the womb will give the spirit the body. So Jesus came out of a woman's womb with a body. He says, a body you gave me, you prepared for me. With burnt offering and sin offering, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and sin offering you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ, once for all, day after day, every priest stand and perform his religious duties. Again and again, he offered the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he won. He waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testified to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I made with, with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my law in their heart. And I'll write them on their minds. Then he asks, their sins and lawless art I'll remember no more. No. There's a sacrifice of someone. And God was so pleased with that sacrifice that he sets aside the sins of all. He says, I'll remember no more. I set aside the sins of all and say, I'll remember no more. Having finished what he was come to do on the cross, having died in our place, Hebrews says that because the children have flesh and blood, 
That is chapter 2. So the son was also given flesh and blood. So he can stand in their stead. And the punishment of their sins could be put upon him. So that by the shedding of blood, there will be remission of sin for all. Now, the Jesus being in the human being's womb was to have him have flesh and blood because it is required of the law. Without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sins. So God, wanting to save us, found himself in a woman's womb. The purpose is for Christ to have flesh and to have blood so that by his blood, he could clean, uh, cleanse away our sins. By his body, he could feel for us. And then by the blood, our sins will be forgiven. And the Bible says that, therefore, as a result of what he has done, let's go back to the testimony that God said concerning his son. 1 John chapter 5. Let's read 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. What does this mean? It simply means that Jesus Christ has become our propitiation. Yeah. He has become the empata, the one who will stand in for us. If you have the Son, you have life. If you don't, you don't have life. Why? Because he has stood in for us. By the shedding of his blood, he has paid for the sins of the whole world. But you have to identify with him to be able to have the benefits of the shed blood. Are we together? Identify with him to be able to have the benefit of the shed blood. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now by what he did, he has become the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Those of us who have believed, because he was writing to a particular people, people who have been born again. But he says, not only for our sins, he is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. That is why when John saw him, by revelation, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the earth. So Jesus is the only one who has qualified to take away our sins. Now, and God did that on oath. It was a testimony. And God did that on oath. We have said that you can't just testify. You must do that by swearing. How did he do it? Now you must swear to someone that is greater than you or a thing that is greater than you. How did God take the oath then? Hebrews chapter 6. Let's read from 16. Let's, maybe let's go to 13 first. When God made his promise to Abraham, let's take it from 13. Since there was no one greater for him to swear by, now listen, when God made a promise to Abraham, he swore by himself. Now we are saying that God's testimony concerning his son will mean that he has to take an oath because you just don't testify. And in the testimony to the whole world, not just to the earth, but to all principalities and powers. So God will take an oath. And the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying that he is just trying to tell us how he did it. He says that when he was swearing to Abraham, when he was promising that he become the father of many nations, he didn't have anyone greater than him to swear to. So he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now look at verse 16. People swear by someone greater than themselves. Is that true? And the oath confirms what is said. 
and put an end to all arguments. So don't tell me that maybe how can God destroy all these people? If I belong to this religion, all roads lead to God. God has sworn by himself. And he says the oath puts an end to all arguments. So don't sit here and then be thinking that this group can be saved, this group can be saved after all. It's not about after all. It's about what is written. God has made a declaration on oath. He has sworn by himself that this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life can be found in the Son, not in any other. He who has the Son has life. What it means is that he who does not have the Son of God does not have life, period. And he says that this is upon declaration, on oath. Verse 17 says that because God wanted, why did he do that? Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear. To the ends of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. So that you don't sit here and be confused. Whether you are saved or not, you are saved. Why? Because he confirmed it with an oath. So that none of us will be confused. Shall we have come to an age where your daughter can come home and say that, I want to marry this young man. He says that, that's a, uh, who is he? He says that he is a large so, so and so. He says, it doesn't matter, it matters. Let me tell you, it matters. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. Now listen, there are certain times that you are sick. The sickness is not going. We have been praying and praying. We begin to wonder. Sometimes you have challenges in your job, challenges in our marriages, and then we begin to wonder. He says that he swore. He took the oath so that you will not have any room to be discouraged at all. There should be no confusion about your destination. When I die, I'm a candidate of heaven. Yeah. Now, not even, I don't have to wait for me to die. Now listen, if I don't go to heaven, none of you will go to heaven. Now, let me tell you for a fact, if I don't go, none of you will go. Because I can't be your leader and for you to go to heaven and leave me behind. I believe in the scriptures. It says that so that none of us will be confused. Maybe today you have a, a, some bad marriage. You want to check out, don't check out. Very soon, he that is to come will come. We are not going to be that free on this planet, earth, not at all. The world will not, will not, will not clothe us with Roses. It doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen. As I stand here as your leader, I don't have it all. I have my own challenges. But my faith has found a resting place. Not in any device, nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds has pleaded for me already. I am saved. I don't have to close my eyes in dead. Then to figure out where I'm going. I am a candidate of heaven. Why? Because it is written. And he's not just written, he did it on oath. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtains where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever. Now, so those who say we don't pay tithes, we are paying it to a high priest. And this one is forever in the order of Melchizedek. How many of us have Jesus as your Lord? Lift up your hands. Are you saved? Are you a candidate to heaven? Don't, be, don't let anyone confuse you at all. He has done it with an oath. I am saved because, what, because of what Jesus did on the cross. He did not just save us. I've said that he has become our propitiation. 
anyone who believes in him will also be saved. Why did he do it that way? Because you see, God is not only a holy God. He is also a loving God. So the, the love of God wanted the sinner to come to him. But the holiness of God will reject the sinner. The righteousness of God will not want the sinner to come. But the mercy of God will want the sinner to come. So then God makes a plan. God makes a plan. Romans chapter 3. This righteousness is given. Or let's go to 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. To which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Eh? The righteousness apart from the law is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Now he's giving us the reason why he did this. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he has left the sin committed beforehand unpunished. Now he says he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. The King James will say that he did this to, uh, to demonstrate his justice. Righteousness and justice in the New Testament are one and of the same thing. Verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness or justice at the present time so that us to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. He says that. He did this. He has made Jesus the propitiation so that anyone who believes in him will be saved. Now, this is to satisfy not your justice, but his justice. What does that mean? Satisfying his righteousness and justice. That is to say that so that his mercy will not say that you left this man out. So that his, his righteousness will not say that let this one go. So he brings Christ as a propitiation. So that anyone who believes in him satisfies God's justice. Because without the shedding of blood, there should be no remission of sin. Now he brings Jesus Christ. He has died for the sins of all. So if you believe in him, you are saved. If you don't, then it is wara. You understand? And that satisfies the justice of God. Not my justice or your justice. So Jesus hanging on the tree is for all. Now he spread out his hands like that, as if to say that, come all of you. Come all of you, come. If you believe in him, you are saved. He is a propitiation for all our sins. If you don't believe in him and the holiness of God rejects you, it is your own problem. Because he has given us Jesus to be our savior already. Are we together? Now, there are two things. This is what we call the gospel. The gospel is the fact that God has given us his son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting. This is the gospel. And Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 to 9, that if anyone comes to tell you any different gospel, apart from what we have taught you, let him be a curse. Then he went on to say that even if I or an angel comes to tell you a different gospel, let that angel or let that man be a curse. What is he trying to say? Why is he saying that? Why is he saying that if anybody comes around saying that there is another savior and that Christ is not the only savior, so let him be a curse. Why? Let's go to the Old Testament and then we'll come. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuteronomy 17 from 8, if a case comes before you, before your court, that are too difficult for you to judge, 
whether bloodshed, lawsuit, or assault. Take them to the place the Lord your God will choose. Now, if there's a case, take them to a place where the Lord will choose. So God had, had cause in the Old Testament already. Go to the Levitical priests and the judge who is in office at that time. Two people you have to go to. Either your case go to the Levitical priest or to the judge who is in office at that time. Because they said for a period, they are not like Jesus Christ who lives forever. Inquire of them and they will give you the verdict. You must act according to the decision they give you at the place the Lord will choose. Be careful to do everything they instruct you to do. Now look at verse 11. Act according to whatever they teach you and the decision they give you. Now if the priest says that this is how the matter should go, act upon it. Or if the judge says this is how the matter should go, act upon it. Do not turn aside from what they tell you. To the right or to the left? Verse 12. Anyone who shows contempt for the judge or for the priest who stands ministering there to the Lord your God is to be put to death. Now listen. If the priest or the judge makes a declaration, so far as the case before him is concerned, and somebody shows contempt, he should be put to death. Hmm. You must purge the evil from Israel. All the people will hear and be afraid and will not be contemptuous again. Now lift your heads and listen. That is Old Testament. If the judge or the priest declares as to how the matter should go, anyone who tries to turn it it should be killed. That is Old Testament stuff. So Paul borrows from there. And then he says that if anyone comes to preach a different gospel other than what we have told you, let him be a curse. He was even being a bit lenient. Because in the Old Testament you would die. Why should he be a curse? Because God has sworn on oath. And who is man? To turn what God has sworn on oath. Because God has declared Jesus as the Lord. Jesus as the Savior. You shouldn't say that no. This one too saves. Paul says that if anybody comes to tell you anything. Other than what has been prescribed. The gospel. That Jesus is the Savior. That is the gospel. If anybody comes to tell you any other Savior. Let him be a curse. In the OT, they would have said, let him die. But in the New Testament, they said, let him be cursed. And I'm trying to give the reason. The reason is that God himself has done that on oath. Who is an angel? Who is an angel? That is why this man in the Old Testament died and sometimes I pity him. God told him that when you go, don't eat. Then a certain old man said that, just a couple of minutes ago, an angel of the Lord. Don't trust angels. Oh. So even if an angel comes to say anything different, let him be a curse. Because God has declared to the whole world on oath that Jesus is Lord. I pray that you hold this one. There are many teachings that, is, that, that are contending for our, your heart. And sometimes we want to make room for them. Don't make room, you'll be cursed. Jesus is the savior of the world. See, two things are essential in this matter. In the court of law, when The judge has not given a declaration. The matter is as if it has never been heard. You keep going and coming. You keep going and coming. 
Any day that you go, he said, Sister John, it's as if nothing has been heard. But your matter has been heard. What you are all waiting for is a declaration. When they make the declaration, the verdict brings an end to the case. Yeah. And the, the judge who is presiding over the case, his office comes to an end so far that case is concerned. Yeah. Now listen. Two things are involved. So the day he says that, I declare. And he brings the matter to a close. Everybody will say, ah, at least it, the matter has come to an end. But two things are involved in the declaration. The declaration is fine, but there is also the rights of the parties involved in the matter. So there are two essentials here. The declaration gives you some space to heave aside. Ah, especially when they tell you that next week there's going to be a declaration. So oh God, I thank you. At least I'll be spared from going and coming. But when he makes a declaration that this is what I think, the case goes to so, so, and so, that is not the end. You have to keep on listening. Because the actual verdict will spell out the rights of the people. So they can say that, okay, we declare that this, but maybe what they will write and write, write, realize that it is as if <laughs> you didn't win any case. Two things are involved. The legal declaration that Jesus made to the whole world, that this is the testimony that life is, can be found in only in Jesus Christ is one. The second one is to pay attention to details. So when you talk about our salvation, the first one is a legal declaration. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says that there is therefore no condemnation. To them that are in Christ Jesus, you are not condemned. You say, hooray. That is a declaration. Then, there are certain things involved. The second one is the imputation of Christ's righteousness on us. One, we are not condemned, but that is not the end of the verdict. Let's go into the second part. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin to us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now listen, this one is involved in the verdict. The declaration is that therefore there is no condemnation to all those who are in Christ Jesus. We are acquainted, we are discharged. Hooray, because we believed in Christ, his finished work. God has justified us. But there are certain things involved. Therefore, there is no condemnation. God made him who has no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This one is loaded. Becoming the righteousness of God is part of your benefits. Now, what that means is this. Everything that Christ is, you are. 1 John 4 verse 17 says that, as he is, so are we in this world. Everything that Jesus is, God has put it on you. You wear it. That is part of the declaration. So that we are not just saved. Everything that Jesus has, we have. He has become our big brother. He is the heir to the throne of God. And the Bible says we are joint heirs with him. Because all that he is, we have also become. When Jesus healed the sick, the Bible says in his name you can also do the same. Everything that he has, we have become. His righteousness has been placed on us. That scripture does not mean that you just walk with your hands behind you, just being sanctimonious. No, you are more than that. All that Jesus is, we have become. We have become. Scripture says that, behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And it says that indeed we are. We are children of God, sons and daughters of the Most High, and all that he is we have become. Ephesians 4, 
verse 24. I want us to read this scripture. Let's say, let's take it from 23. To be made new in the attitude of your mind. Now you have to make, make sure that you change your mind. So for us, what Jesus Christ has done is concerned. You have to be made new in the attitude of your mind. Verse 24 says that, and to put on the new self, created to be like God. In true righteousness and holiness, we, by virtue of his death on the cross and our believing in him, God has declared us righteous. And in the verdict, we have been created to be like God. How many of us know that we have been created to be like God? Create? Now, listen, now. listen to this one. He didn't say that you have been made a child of God. You have been created to be like God. So that in your home, when there's somebody is sick and the person is shouting, Iradi, 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 show up and say, Can I help you? Yeah, and let the God in you work. You have been created to be like God. All this is part of the verdict. Deuteronomy said that when the declaration is made, act upon it. Did you hear Deuteronomy 17? Um. Let me call Justice Eric Chambers, Cheba for please come. So we have gone to court this morning. So I want him to come. Let's say that there is some litigation between the two of us. He is not going to judge <laughs> between the two of us. Then the judge. He judges the case on my behalf. <laughs> Isaac, <laughs> on my behalf. Or let's say he judges in his favor. Then we go home. It's about a, a, a plot of land. So a week later, I go to the very plot which has been declared to be his. And I start building. When you come and you find me there, what will you do? <laughs> <laughs> you lost the case and you heard what the court said. Yes. You have violated the orders of the court by yes. going onto the land. Yes. It amounts to contempt of court. Yes. So well, let it be case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. But, so what will you do? What will be your action? Then? Uh, and so mm -hmm. I will file an application yeah. for the court to punish you yeah. for violating the orders of the court. So when you come and you find me digging, will you stand there and say, oh, oh this man, what are you trying to do? Will no, you say that? I can stop you right then. Why? Because you have trespassed onto my land. Because of the authority that you have. That is it. Chairman, chairman. <laughs> <laughs> now listen the problem that we have as Christians is that we don't know what is involved in the verdict so we don't act upon it see all that Jesus has done is for our benefit if you don't act upon it it's as if nothing has been done act upon it <laughs> I traveled to UK and I met this woman who was complaining and talking about witches and wizards who have followed her to UK. And then she was trying to give me a very wonderful reason. He, she was saying that she sees ants almost all the time in her room. And then she attributes that to witches. Then I looked at her. She, she was a dickness too. I suspect she is still a dickness. So I asked her, do you have insecticide in your home? <laughs> then she said, ah, you too, Osofo, when we are talking about serious things, you see, you see what, where she is putting her seriousness? I said, if you have insecticide, give it to me. Show me where they are. This thing does not need in the name of Jesus. It needs just some, some spring. I said, who made you a dickness? Then she, she looked up and looked at me. 
somebody like this a dickness who does not know what is in the verdict? Even if they are witches, you have been created to be like God. So I said, I'm sure the first aunt looks like your grandfather and the last one looks like your grandmother. Now listen, we are filling the whole Christendom now with messages that does not bear any fruit. We come here, we talk about witches and wizards. While what is in us is greater than what is in the world. We have been created to be like Christ. We are justified. And the verdict that has been given, we must know it. This is for us. Until you walk in it, it's as if you are not justified. I want to end here because of time. What then is justification? It's an instantaneous legal act of God in which God forgives us our sins and imputes Christ's righteousness on us. God accepts the sinner not for anything produced in them or done by them, but only for the full satisfaction of Christ's perfect obedience to him. God, the judge, has examined the sinner and declared him or her not guilty, innocent, righteous, because Jesus has done all that is necessary by way of the death on the cross. It is a judicial act of God, whereby a sinner who puts his or her faith in Jesus Christ is declared righteous in the eyes of God and are set free from guilt and punishment. This is the declaration. But beyond it, there are graces that have come to us because of our faith in Christ. This morning, who is justified? Let me see by show of hands now. You are justified because you believe in the finished work of Christ. And in the justification, God did it because he swore by himself. He swore an oath. Nobody... Not even an angel should overturn it. Otherwise, he, that will be God's court, content of God's court. You cannot stand it. That is the gospel. The gospel is simple. When we go out there, don't let us tell people that Jesus will heal you. He didn't say, I will heal you. Tell them that he has died for us. And in him, is, he is the propitiation. And anyone who believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. How many of us have life? Everlasting life, just stand on your feet now and I begin to pray. Just bless the name of the Lord for who you are. Bless the name of the Lord for who you are in Christ. Bless him, bless him. Say, Father, I want to thank you. I bless you for who you have made me to become in Jesus Christ. That old ragged cross, our identification with the cross has saved all of us. Oh, halabasande de 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 babani. Beyond the basende bakiriando mosenda de babani. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. All things have passed away. I am born again. More than a conqueror, that's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Rose sabatayan de 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 bokobanda. There is no confusion at all. You are a new creation. We shouldn't say that all roads lead to God. No, not all roads do not lead to God. All roads do not lead to God. Jesus is the only savior of this world. He is the only one that God has declared on oath that he has the power to save. He has done that through his blood. Jesus the Savior. Come on. My faith has found a resting place, not in divides, nor creed. I trust the ever. His wounds for me shall be. 
I need no other. I need no, no other argument. I need no other need. It is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. Enough for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves this ends my fear and doubt a sinful soul, a sinful soul. I come to him, he'll never cast me either. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Now I want us to sing the part that says I need no other. Sing it with faith. Sing it with vigor. Because he says that the oath settles all arguments. And he has, he has, he has declared Jesus as Lord on oath he is the only savior of the earth there is no one it's not like that the one who people are saying he is that man is not he is not there is nobody there should be no argument in your mind at all my faith has found ready go my faith has found the resting place not, not in device no creed I trust the ever living one his wounds for me shall no other I need no other argument I need no other it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and be very, very gracious unto you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And amen. And our repentance, justification, sanctification, are not three different stages of salvation. No, no. Repentance does not save, no. Justification does not save. Sanctification does not also save. The cause of our salvation is that man that was nailed to the tree. He is the cause of our salvation. Oh, glory to God. And this has been the words of Apostle Eric Wabna Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost on repentance, justification, and sanctification. Yes, that man, Jesus, is the cause of our salvation. So, my dear friend, this is where I extend an invitation to you to accept Jesus Christ into your life by turning away from your sins and yielding unto him. So wherever you're watching Pentecost or on Pen TV, once again, and you have taken a firm decision, please repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, 
I accept you today as my Lord and personal Savior. I will live for you all the days of my life. So help me, God. God richly bless you. And if you have said a prayer, kindly call any of the numbers on the screen and we will give you the needed attention. The first contact number is the number of the church's counselor, Apostle Philip Osekosa. The second contact number is my number. That is the media pastor. And the third contact number is the number of the head of protocol, Elder David Tego. So these numbers have always been on the screen. You can call any of them and they will assist you. Once again, my dear friend, this has been Pentecost Hour, proudly sponsored by the Church of Pentecost Headquarters. We shall come your way once again with your favorite program, Pentecost Hour, God willing, tomorrow with Apostle Dr. Walker, Director of the Pentecost University College. God richly bless you. And may you continue to remain in Christ, to walk in Him, and to please Him in everything you do. Shalom, peace, caris. Bye-bye.
is what shows we're children of God. That is the basic word.